Okay, as soon as I find my agenda, we're off. Yes, so I'm here and we're going to start. You are here. Yeah, because Senator Sorotkin and I are supposed to be at the Pro Tem's office, but I don't think we're going. And then it, the next bill we're doing is his. So we're going to start and walk through this. And Senator, do you want to say anything about this sure, bill? I, I, Peter, I, you can come on up. And just for Senators and Madam Chair, I appreciate you <coughs> indulging me. Um, I, I just am hoping we can get an overview. The governor and uh, Commissioner, oh, excuse me, Deputy Secretary Watt announced in December that they're exploring this Transportation Climate Initiative, that is sometimes called TCI. He knows everything about it. I know nothing about it other than that. But okay. it is an idea that is crudely parallels Reggie in the transportation sector and could have an impact on our utilities, uh, clearly has an impact on potentially climate. And I end up being handled by the um, executive branch, rightly. Um, so I was just hoping we could understand some of the decision making, some of the principles that they're looking at. You know, are there milestones where they will say yes or no along the way? Just kind of that structure okay. just for, for our curiosity and potentially our work down the road. Assume that the truth, we know nothing, <laughs> and bring us up to speed. Great. Uh, for the record, I'm Peter Walk, Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources. Thank you for having me in. Um, Transportation Climate Initiative has been going on since 2010. Uh, usually Justin Johnson follows me around as I do this roadshow, and he was the okay. first uh, A&R Deputy Secretary to sign on. He might have been commission, DEC Commissioner when he signed uh, on the TCI. It has been a group of transportation and energy and environmental officials from each uh, each of the states talking about ways in which to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector. Uh, the region, the TCI region, is every state along the eastern seaboard from Maine to now Virginia, uh, including Pennsylvania, which is somewhat different from the Virginia region. Also includes the District of Columbia uh, as well. Um, the in, so that group has been discussing various policy ideas and doing the research around what it would take to do certain things in the transportation region since 2010. There have been a few steps along the way. Most recent, there was a regional listening tour that brought together stakeholders to talk about various potential options. Um, the idea that was coalesced around was to explore what a cap and trade system for transportation might look like, transportation emissions. Uh, for for uh, reference, we have a cap and trade system for our, our power production sector, so our utilities operate under a cap and trade system called REGI, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Um, we, so we announced in December that the nine states, I believe, in the District of Columbia would, would work together to see if we could develop a policy uh, proposal for each state to then review and decide whether or not they wanted to participate. So that's, we gave ourselves 12 months to complete that review, and then next December, the state decides whether it's in or out. Uh, there are many steps along the way and decision points along the way. Uh, cap and trade systems, which I'll go through sort of generally what they are, are somewhat complicated, but they are effective in their efficiency at getting the market to drive behavior in a cost-effective way. Um, so, but there are lots of lots of points of discussion, and we work generally on consensus, as you can imagine, trying to get nine states with lots of different interests engaged and to make decisions in a meaningful way is, is a challenge. And so, when I have talked about this with other committees, it, it, I just want to make sure everybody's aware that a year timeline for to make these decisions kind of scares the living crap out of me in terms of all the things we have to do. There are issues related to. Who, who are we regulating? What what level is this happening? Who are? What does the cap look like, and how does it decrease over time? What are the market mechanisms in place to make sure that there are there's not speculation on the market, which drives prices higher than than we can sustain? 
all sorts of pieces of play. So, but generally speaking, a cap and trade system is one where the the government entities set a an initial cap on emissions. So we want no more than a thousand uh, metric ton equivalent of, of carbon dioxide to be emitted for the transportation sector. Whatever, From the transportation. Whatever that might be. So this this has to just to do with the transportation sector. And then we say over time we want it to get to 800 in the course of 10 years, whatever that, that slope is on that graph. The market then responds by buying what we call allowances from, uh, from government to, to basically say we think we can reach that goal at this price per ton of, of carbon. And so the, the market sets the, the overall price for the cost of, of carbon. And then the cap forces that trajectory to go down over time. So, the, so that, that trajectory forces, so that we get the greenhouse and gas emissions reductions that we're looking for. Um, and then typically in Reggie, those proceeds have been reinvested into programs that help, help Vermonters achieve the goals that they more easily, so it, it could, Result in you know the revenues being sent on helping people, you know, helping more public transit happen, or people get into electric vehicles, or any any number of things that help make our our transportation system more efficient. Um, the the way Reggie has worked is all of those proceeds. We said we have efficiency Vermont already. Uh, it's doing what it needs to do from an efficiency perspective, from an electrical efficiency perspective. So the, the legislature decided to invest those proceeds into thermal efficiency, which are programs that are run through BED, uh, Efficiency Vermont, and Vermont Gas as the efficiency, energy efficiency utilities in the thermal sector. So where we are now is, is really we're at the sort of forming stage of the of this process. We have to decide as a group of states how we are going to make decisions, whether we're going to continue to operate under consensus, what decisions we have to make in order to narrow the field of policy choices, and then how do we engage stakeholders and engage our legislators along the way. Um, it is a lot, there are a lot of potential variables that could go into this and go into our evaluation and we need to limit what some of those are. And we have experience through Reggie and other programs to kind of know where we want to, what levers we want to pull and where we want to set things. Uh, but we have to come to an agreement on that. And then we need to do some, some economic modeling to show what we think the outcomes are going to be and what the effect on prices will be so people have a general sense of what this might mean for Vermont, and so that we can make informed decisions about whether to participate or not. Um, because it's not clear at this point without doing this analysis what exactly it will mean for Vermonters. I'm, you know, when we do cap and trade, we're talking about utilities. Yep. We have some control over utilities. When you talk about transportation, you're generally talking about individual. <coughs> people yep. over whom we have less control, and I believe it's been said that that is one of the more inelastic sections of people's budgets. So what kind of things are you looking at? I mean, I... Yeah. So, so that, that, that speaks to exactly that the, the people don't respond to the price. They respond to opportunities to make a decision in the you know when they're making a capital purchase okay. to save money on operating going forward. So we need that capital purchase. So you and I, when we decide our net when we're looking for our next vehicle, are going to be saying, well, the, the price is trending upwards, so I'm gonna look for something that's more fuel efficient, or I'm gonna get into try to get into an electric vehicle where I can you know separate that equation altogether. Um, that's where the most action takes place, and that's where the reinvestment of proceeds and incentives and other things can become incredibly invaluable uh, because you get that, that virtuous cycle piece. Because you're right, that we people can cut out some of their driving generally, but not very much of it. And we generally see most people over, as prices go up slowly over time, they sort of just deal more and complain more than, than we're changing behavior significantly. 
Do you have a question? I remember the gas crisis when on Saturdays you, you often saw the commuter car in the parking lot, people were out, and then it went over to the, the, it was the van that was in the parking lot on Saturdays, and the people were out, were out uh, shopping on Saturdays. They were making changes you know, for a subtle. We were, and, and we certainly saw that post Katrina when gas prices went up really high. People started to make different decisions, but as as prices have generally come back down and stayed relatively low, we're seeing right now the more and more people are going back to crossovers and SUVs than they were when they're buying smaller cars mm -hmm. um, in the sort of mid to late two thousands. And so, the you know, and so there are lots of. The, the sort of automobile marketplace is a, you know, a difficult one to take on, and it's all of us, it's all our individual choices. Uh, I think that the hard part about what we've created over the past 100 years is that we've created an automobile-focused society that is, uh, that where, the, where what you drive is a, is a lifestyle choice. And right now there aren't, a lot of options in the electric vehicle marketplace to really sort of <coughs> match what people want to get out of the performance of their vehicle. And so that that is going to be in terms of whether that be an all-wheel drive model or a you know a pickup truck or any number of things that not what people Something are they can deal with mud season. Exactly. Soon For instance. Us. Uh, yeah. Hopefully the, you know well we've got enough snow that it should be about May by the time we get to mud season. It's <laughs> true. Um, so yeah, so that's the that there's a you know that it's it is way more complicated than the uh, power production sector, and that's yeah. part of the reason why Reggie started there. There was always the thought that it might expand into other sectors, but our both our transportation and our heating, building heating, are which are our two biggest emissions sectors, are are difficult to deal with because they are. We don't change the capital equipment we use to, that dictates what fuel we can consume very often. No. Uh, so you need to we need to find ways to change the behavior at the point of purchase, uh, <coughs> rather than to just have like, expect the price of energy to change the behavior. Senator, no, I so I understand in a sort of traditional cap and trade model that everyone um, falls under all actors, and it's, you, as I understand it, to my limited knowledge around Western Climate Initiative, for instance, it's industry. And so they're forced to ratchet down emissions, and somebody says, well, I can actually make it down here, and so this guy says, oh, great, I'll buy that credit. And so the, the, the sort of, the regulation is clear and the motivation is clear. Yep. In that, as you understand this framework, are all people who are using transportation subjects to the caps, or so the the way it hasn't. So that's one of the decision points. That's one of the decision points we have to come to because what that point of regulation is. Because it's really easy with the utilities because they're both the generators yeah. and the appliance companies, right? Easy. We're all the generators, yeah. mm -hmm. and so where that point of compliance matters, but you can't do it so far down. I mean, we all can't enter the marketplace and decide how many allowances we need. We'd never be able to do that. So, it, and you know, the cost to operate that system would be astronomical. <coughs> so you need to go upstream to, to a wholesaler, to the rack, to any number. You know, there are different options of where you could put that point of regulation, and so. They can then trade within their peers to to who can make the most reductions. Can you um, give me an example of what I trade? So, a, a car dealer? Or? No, it would be a fuel supplier. So a fuel wholesaler, that sort of. Um, not necessarily. So not even at the gas station level, would be up another sort of tier. Uh, it, it, so it. All right. Cool. Um, I think we need to see what it's going to mean. How we're going to what it's going to look like. Yeah. You know, this this is an information gathering period, but we need specifics to work with to know what we're looking at, and it helps to sort of see what each state is comfortable with in that process. So that if we do move forward, we're past the step of sort of negotiating out the details. We can have a negotiation 
negotiate out the details and if people like it, they can do it. If not, they don't have to. Um, can I ask a question about timing? I mean, so the analysis and talking with possible partners, how long does that take? It's going to take most of, I would say, until early to mid fall. And then we have, we're going to have basically have like a two month period of, of intense negotiation to, to try to figure out what the outcome, the final outcome is. And in the way we, we typically do it with Reggie, is there are certain proposals that get modeled and certain variables that get modeled so people can see what the price impacts are or what the impact on emissions might be by taking different approaches. And then that gives people something substantive to comment on rather than just sort of general sort of as, as sort of general commentary. And what I spoke with your colleagues in Senate Transportation about was um, we'll be in a place for that to happen kind of late summer, which is not ideal from your timing perspective, but there's no way we're going to get to that before then. And so if there's, if there's a way for, for me to provide that update in some way, some form to the committee or to, to some subset of the Senate, I'd be happy to do that at that point. Um, we understand that you'll be interested, and we understand that you're asking us to sort of, you know, sort of stay with this process. When you know, they're at this point, I'm not asking for a role from you. Right. And in some ways, I would ask for you to take a take a come back to me sort of come back to us sort of a role because. Or is we're thinking about we we like to have a role. Yeah, and, and then, so the way it's worked, the way it worked with Reggie is sort of the administration negotiated uh, lots of pieces, and then came back to you to talk about sort of overall authority to run the program, yeah. uh, rule making authority to be able to put the specifics in place, and then you decided what to do with the proceeds. So by next January, when we're back, this will be pretty. It, it should be it should be baked at that point. Okay. What baked looks like is right. Okay. 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 And just for the committee's and Madam Chair's information, I did ask the Ledge Council to help me understand what we did in the Reggie era, which was similar. It was a Douglas administration initiative. We didn't do anything until it was signed and then we were asked and the legislature did very quickly actually respond and put into statute different elements uh, uh, that we now think of as ready. So and I'll, we're in a reactive role then. And, mm -hmm. so. and I'll certainly defer to, to Ledge Council, but you did, uh, you have over the past several years put laws and books that, that encourage us to pursue these items um, and to, you know, to, to go for it and, and to to yes. work on regional solutions to <clears throat> climate crisis. So. I think they'd be much more effective. I mean, considering the number of cars in Vermont and the number of cars <clears throat> in any of those other states mm -hmm. and the density, um, they're going to have a lot more impact than we are if yeah. we all do the yeah, same we have thing. A, we have a massive impact if we do something at the regional level. Yes. Yeah. Probably the only thing. And if we do, if we in Vermont did something that was more likely to lower greenhouse gases, would we receive benefits from the other states that don't? So it, it, person? it is a, it's all about, it's all about, it's, so we, we, you have to, the, the we is a little bit different. So if the, if our regulated entities do things that, that are cost effectively saving money, then then and so don't need to buy as many allowances and therefore aren't passing on as much price to consumers, then we win in that scenario. Compared to the other states other that are states. in this. Right. In the, in the it, it, it's a little bit different than in Reggie where where because they're they're fixed and we know where they are, we know where the power is going. It's a little bit different, but we so um, for instance, in when, when we joined Reggie, we argued for and got more sort of a, a healthy, healthier share of the allowance of the proceeds of the auction than we might get under a different scenario. And so it's always been a relatively good deal for Vermont. What happens in the transportation sector? Who becomes, you know, sort of business leaders in this process is I'm supposed to be TBD at this them. point. And so it's hard to know exactly how that would shake out, but we can get the best or best estimates we can. Are you? I'm not.
yourself. Very well. Two. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Encouraging. Yeah. So are you the lead between the states? I mean, it sounds like it. Okay. Yes. Now we're still working out schedules. So yeah. So so the and then so just a little more on timeline. We're actually I'm down in D.C. flying down tomorrow uh, to participate in the first kind of phase meeting since the announcement in December. We've been doing a lot of like work around sort of trying to come up with some of the pieces, but we really need to get in the same room and kind of talk through what are the decision points and what what is sort of the laying fruit that we can just decide on now to help that frame up more of the rest of the Is the attitude generally positive or? Uh, you know. Yeah, what's it, what's? I would say the, the attitude from all the states that are working on this is, is positive and, the, you know, but they all want to see the details just as we do too, right? You know, it's, mm -hmm. it, it sounds potentially effective and potentially cost effective, but we need to see what it looks like, right? We need to see what the economic modeling tells us likely to happen. And it may go, we may get the results back and see that the prices are higher than we're willing to accept and that's a place where I think all the states are. They want to see what the details are and they want to be able to, to see whether it makes sense. So it's not, it's not sort of a, everybody's cautiously optimistic, I guess I would say. Um, the only the, I should note the only states that are not in of the group is Maine, New Hampshire, and New York. Maine is coming in, we believe, now that they've changed administrations. Uh, New York, New Hampshire has had a seat at the table in the discussions. They're, it's unclear what they're doing. Uh, New York. New York had a little hiccup right before the announcement, uh, but we do believe they will eventually participate. So there, there may be a change with Maine. We're, we've, we've already gotten positive indications right. that Maine is, while they're not official yet, they're likely to become. Got a new administration that might. Be yeah, there's a slightly different feel around Maine yeah. right now. <laughs> so, Just slightly. Okay. Yeah, it's, I'm surprised New York isn't. New Hampshire, not so much. But. New York is not a policy issue. It's. Mm, uh, I worked in New York for there. three and a half years. I know exactly what happened. I'm going to let them have their issues and, and, They'll work it out. and chastise them when we need to. So okay. you still think they're possible. Oh, yeah. They're, they're at the table. They're negotiating. We need their expertise. Right. We need their, honestly, their, their oh, emissions cool. and proceeds. Yeah. Uh, and so we'll. I think we all understand how little snafus can happen. Mm -hmm. It never happens here. No, <coughs> uh, absolutely not. Is there anything that I think of Maine, uh, when I think of Maine, I realize they have some refineries there. And, and uh, are we one of the only states in the We're not discussion the without any? I mean, we just don't have that fossil fuel. Yeah. We are, I don't know if we're the only, but there aren't very many that, that don't. The other question. So one of the other major questions is which fuels are covered. It seems fairly obvious to us that it's gas and on-road diesel, but what about ports? What about air traffic? Right? I just think of as a kid riding through Newark, New Jersey. Yeah, right. So the port of New York, New York, New, York, New Jersey is. It, you know, if that's included, then bunker bunker fuels are included. That's a whole different discussion. Uh, and I would imagine that those states are going to feel pretty strongly that if, you know, if it's not the full region, that they're going to have a hard time accepting that because people have choices where they pull it. Yeah. So, yeah, Portsmouth's um, going to have to be in there, and New York, and New yep. Jersey, and Baltimore, all of the Chicago, Baltimore, and Philadelphia, Philadelphia yeah. all of the majors. So all of those are in right now. Uh, but they're in, as I describe it, it's a two-gate process. <coughs> in for the discussion on the policy development, and then you have to decide whether it's something you actually want to do. Okay. And we're in the first gate. Okay. Sounds like the committee will talk about it. Yeah, it does. For, yeah. Sounds okay. Any other questions? Are there any things that we could do to um, make some inroads while we're considering? The bigger picture. Well, I think we're there are lots of things that we're already working on that are making inroads. I would I would ask 
I would, you know, your transportation committee is doing some interesting work on um, how do we how do we work on incentivizing electric vehicles, but also make sure that over time, that as we transition to a more electrified transportation system, that the transportation system gets funded, uh, and making sure that that phases in over time, uh, because if they're not paying the gas tax, then they're still riding on the road. Right. Exactly. Uh, so there's great stuff happening there. Uh, the VW settlement money, the big $18.7 million slug, which is going towards primarily towards uh, vehicle heavy duty vehicle transformation projects, right? So changing out buses for from diesel to electricity and to other things of that nature is going to have a huge transition on the system. I think the approach that we've taken from the bus fleet perspective is to, because there are complications with winter weather driving and how the buses perform relative to that, um, we have uh, put out for RFP a, a, a pilot project for um, a combination, but both transit bus and school bus uh, pilot to better understand that so that we can have the data and the support for for school districts and for transit fleet managers as they make that transition. So it's not just putting out instead of money and, and sort of money goes where it goes. This, we hope to have the data and the support for folks to be able to, to make that transition when it becomes simply economical on its own. Um, and it's getting closer to that with the amount of money saved on operations and maintenance and fuel and other time. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for putting up with our scheduling issues. Uh, you know, as we said, it's the first time that's happened. <laughs> crazy. Thought okay. this place run like a pitch ship. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Peter, I think we're going to go with you since Senator Sorotkin is missing. There was one sighting. The field trip was late getting back. He came in, hung up his coat, and left. And we thought he might be in the meeting that he and I were supposed to have at 1.30, only no one's there. So we're here until notified otherwise. Great, so Peter Griffin, Office of Legislative Council, to walk the committee through S87. Uh, I was trying to remember, this came to the point in the session where there's a lot of things going on. And, uh, and walking in here, I thought, I, I think I've talked to these guys about this subject before. And um, you have not seen this bill before, this language, but I did come in earlier in the session and did a short presentation on online travel companies. And that's what, yes. that's what it was triggering yep. for me. So this is a bill that makes some changes to the definitions in the rooms tax um, that Vermont imposes on the um, <coughs> uh, rental of a room. And um, it creates a category of uh, people called booking agents. And two types of operators are going to fall into this new definition of booking agents. And let's back up for a second, I guess. The rooms tax is due on um, uh, the rent uh, collected by an operator of a hotel. And so um, what the changes in this bill will do is bring into the definition of operator booking agents. And booking agents are going to include two groups of people, or operator, or two businesses primarily. The online travel companies, uh, like Expedia, who collect rent, and uh, the short-term rental platforms, like VBRO, that collect rent. Basically, there's uh, been a compliance problem with the short-term rentals online when, when small operators or small uh, small operators are renting through those platforms. And there was also a problem, if you remember, with the online travel companies about the increment. Companies like Expedia were not um, remitting the tax on the increment that they collected over the wholesale price of the room. Basically what this language does is it says anybody who collects rent has to collect and remit the room's tax. So the impact would be that an online travel company like Expedia, if they collect the money from the person who makes the reservation, they need to collect and remit the rooms tax on the entire amount. If you are uh, an internet platform like um, HomeAway that collects the rent from the person making the reservation, you uh, have to collect and remit the entire rooms tax. If you don't collect the rent, if you're somehow just a vehicle, like uh, you know, people can uh, find things through something like Craigslist, or you know, if you're not, if you're an internet site or, or, or a, 
an entity that is not collecting the rent, you aren't brought in through the booking agent language. But it's designed basically to bring in those two groups, the online travel companies and the short-term rental platforms. Um, what about traditional travel agents? So traditional travel agents don't typically collect the rent. Right. Okay. They usually set it all up and get a fee, either from the, the traveler or from the, the okay. entity. But so you wouldn't pay the travel agent if Senator Cummings were going to Northeast Kingdom <coughs> for a, some kind of special weekend. She pays the travel agent. They don't pay the travel agent the two thousand to cover all expenses, especially in the last nice weekend. That's yeah. that's my understanding of the traditional um, the traditional. I've already to Acapulco <laughs> <or> somewhere. <laughs> well, I booked you the kingdom. So <laughs> happy anniversary. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I mean, what is the question? Sure. The, the, the mm -hmm. typical arrangement, uh, such as a rental that you make online uh, and you pay at the hotel, that transaction is entirely taxable. Uh, does, in that situation, is it typical that there is a fee that the hotel pays the lister separately? Words, how, how does, the, how does the, the agent who, when a transaction is paid for at the hotel, for example, how does that agency get paid? So, uh, I, my expertise in this area is not deep, but my understanding is that and maybe this isn't the question you're asking. One model is that I own a hotel and I have my, my own website. That's is that that's not what is that what you're asking? No. Okay. No, I'm not. For example, you you may you might do a rental with Expedia in which you don't pay Expedia or a company like that. Right. You pay at the hotel when you check in, like on bookings.com. Uh, you pay, you may pay, I think it's bookings, but one other. You pay at the hotel and you pay whatever the amount is that you charge. Uh, presumably, there is some fee that the booking agency is getting from somewhere, and my question is, do you know where? Do I know where their fee is coming from? Mm -hmm. I do not. What you're describing, although it's happening online, mm -hmm. sounds more like what I understand a traditional travel agency arrangement mm -hmm. to be, exactly. where someone is making the arrangements and either collecting a fee from you or the traveler or from the, the places where you're booked. Yeah, because it's not typically in those situations, it's not connected to the traveler. Right. And, 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 and in, the, in the situation you're describing, mm -hmm. it would not be one where the third party making the reservation would be required to collect and admit here. If you showed up at the hotel and paid the bill at the hotel, it would be the hotel's responsibility to collect and admit, even under this language. It's, it's driven by where the money exchange happens. Is that that's essentially, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why. This language is, is designed to try and capture who is being paid the rent in the first instance, and not worrying about the secondary uh, transactions between Expedia. If they, I don't mean to point out which Expedia in particular, there, um, but trying not to look at the secondary transactions between the online travel company and the hotel. Maybe they pre-bought the rooms, and maybe that um, they have some sort of agreement to pass the cost through automatically. Um, it's, what this language does, it says, if you collect the rent, you can collect and remit the room's tax as well. Um, I mean, the language is not, it's not, it's not complicated. There's only a few sections. Um, and the definition of operator on the first and second page um, is a single line that includes booking agents. In the uh, definition of rent, it's a single line that says rent shall include all amounts collected by booking agents, except for the tax that's required to be collected under the section. And then it defines a booking agent down the bottom of page two, top of page three. It means a person who facilitates the rental of an occupancy and collects rent for an occupancy, and who has the right access, ability, or authority to an internet transaction or any other means to offer, reserve, book, arrange for, remarket, distribute, broker, resell, or facilitate an occupancy that is subject to the tax under this chapter. The second section simply has um, uh, kind of a conforming change. Right now, if, if you're someone who is required to uh, collect and remit the meals tax or the rooms tax, you're supposed to get a license. And the forming change just makes it clear that a booking agent only needs one license. They don't need a separate license for each property that has a rental where they uh, have facilitated. Um, kind of change was made a few years ago when um, 
vending machines were brought into the meals tax. You didn't need a license for every vending machine. You just needed one single. Yeah, so Senator Sorokin, is it your understanding that we're not getting a lot of times the monies that are due to the state, and therefore this is why you're proposing this? Or is it for greater efficiency? There's two elements, and I guess we'll have joint fiscal and the joint fiscal people in at some point because they've done you know, analysis on it. Uh, one is the commissions are not being, the tax on the commissions are not being submitted to the state. And other states have packaged the entire cost of the rental, including commissions, <coughs> into their taxable income. So as we were talking about, if you book directly from a hotel, you pay two hundred dollars. Yeah. You pay the tax on two hundred dollars. If you go through a booking agent, they may take out thirty dollars. Right. You don't pay the tax on the thirty dollars. So we're losing that income. Probably the bigger thing in this bill is now what they're doing is the same situation we had with um, Airbnb, where we were able to collect all the taxes on short-term rentals that were booked through Airbnb. Now they're going to be able, through this language, to collect it on the other big platforms. And we had in our committee, we had somebody from um, Expedia, I believe it was, who owns VRBO, and they said that they, they finally have brought their platform technology up where they're going to be able to cut the same kind of arrangement with the state of Vermont that Airbnb did. So we should see a significant amount of money because these platforms will now be collecting all of the taxes on these individual homes. And they won't be, they will, so the $30 fee that they might charge, that will also be part of the tax now. And that's, that's not, separate. That's, that's separate. Through, that's through like Expedia or, right. or Booking.com. Yeah. That's, uh, so that's not part of this at all. You're not trying to get deal and work. Right. Okay. I have to. You're supposed to go across the hall. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You're very popular. <laughs> we missed our meeting, right? Yeah, we did, because we weren't there. I heard it went by this. We thought the Pro Tem was on your trip. <clears throat> so, they'll catch us. Maybe they can catch us on our break. Okay. Other questions? I don't know that. I think I got explained where the rent goes with the agents. Okay. I don't know that he was invited to testify, but I think Graham has done a fiscal note. Okay, this, this was supposed to be our issue. initial walkthrough, but Graham was here. He's gone, he's testifying. Another committee, which may be what we didn't get into. But we should be able to move this out, I think, pretty quickly. Um, we'll see where it goes. Okay. I think that's it. I saw David Mickenberg here, and now he's not. I see him one now. Yeah, would you, if he's lurking around in the hall? Okay, committee, we now have AES 54, which is the cannabis bill. I am. This bill? Yeah, then we can move it right out. Okay. Um, we're looking for David for cannabis. Okay. Um, he was he, just in he here. He was just in here and left. Um, but who else? I've been told we've done this bill three times, several times. And that a lot of it is going to be negotiated in the committee of conference because um, it's going to the House when it leaves here. And they have not come to terms 
with what they really want to do. So we've got some placeholders, um, and I just need to know who this committee would like to hear from. Ah, Mr. Mickenberg. Um, because it's turning out to be remarkably complicated. Um, it's something we're not we're not going to do in two weeks in all probability in any detail because we don't know we don't know the questions to ask. So, David, come on up. Go back to cannabis. There is a prevention bill being worked on in health and welfare, which hopefully will combine all of our prevention programs, drugs, alcohol, cannabis, and see if we can't pool our money and find an effective, a more effective way to use it. I've not but, seen that yet, but mm -hmm. I haven't seen it yet. I look forward to it. No, I, Senator Lyons is working on it. Okay. Uh, David Mickenberg on behalf of the Maryland Policy Project. I don't have a, um, a deep agenda, but I was here, I offered myself to the chair to answer some questions. I've been working on this issue for 21, about 21 years now, give or take. Um, and Vermont, I just want to say it's sort of high level. Vermont, I think, has done it the Vermont way with an incremental approach um, uh, and has culminated in a bill in S54, which is very consumer focused and reasonable with a regulatory regime in place, which tries to protect um, the consumers and the public um, from not just sort of the ills of, of cannabis, but importantly, the ills of, of illegal cannabis. So um, one of the things that I just wanted to offer as some thoughts and what is you're discussing tax rates, right now in the bill, it's a 10% excise tax. And I just wanted to reflect on how that varies. As you've seen in your charts, there's there's, it's all over the place in terms of other states. Um, it's very creative, I would say. Yes. So the financing. The financing tax all, over, all over, yeah. yeah. All over the country. Yeah. 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 I mean, Washington has a 37% tax rate, but there was in 2017, I think, 1.3 billion in sales in the state of Washington. Um, to date, in Colorado, Colorado is slightly lower, but to date, uh, since 2014, when they're um, when their law went into effect, there's been $6 billion worth of cannabis sales in the state of Colorado, uh, cumulatively. And last year it was in the one point something billion dollars. So I think <coughs> Senator Brock or Senator Sorokin, somebody had asked the question, how do we know that we're undercutting the illicit market? Well, there's a clear relationship between how much is being spent in the uh, legal market versus what is being spent in the illicit market. And while, um, each state varies in terms of undercutting the illicit market. The tax rate is an important component of that. Um, in Colorado, uh, I think there was a question about why, why does the illicit market continue? Well, Colorado is surrounded by states which do not have um, legal <coughs> cannabis. So I think there's flow outside of the borders of Colorado just as much. Uh, inside, so What's I think. What's the tax percentage in Colorado? Um, yeah, it's very low. Yeah. No, it's in the. It's, 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 it's a. There's. It's 15. tax upon tax upon tax. But yeah. in Colorado, it's. Um, it's a high. Fifteen percent retail excise, and then fifteen percent sales tax with a local option of up to eight percent. So. Okay. Yeah, and it depends on whether the local option is in place. So that's thirty percent, right? Yeah. The sale price. Yeah. Now, one thing you have to consider is that the the price of of cannabis as far as the dry flower is dropping uh, every day. I mean, there was talk of uh, an ounce of cannabis being sold both in the legal and illicit markets at around $400 an ounce a few years ago. Now, in Colorado, Oregon, places like that, we're looking at $100, to $100 per ounce to $80 per ounce. Now, for manufactured products, that's different. I think the price continues to stay more stable because it's a lot harder to manufacture um, a product than it is to, to grow it. Um, so, um, added, added, or they just added benefit. Added benefit. Yeah. 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 
So the, really the headline, or the one thing I wanted to say is with Massachusetts, the effective rate in Massachusetts is around 20%, depending on whether the local option is put in. And I would encourage you all um, to stay either at or slightly below. I mean, that means we my area. Dramatic. Well, that's what I say. Rarely does Vermont have a chance to have a lower tax rate than one of our neighbors. But um, here, if you were slightly below in terms of uh, the attractiveness of if people are price conscious, um, it would be helpful uh, on the borders. So depends on what we do with the price of gas. Uh, yeah, I mean we are. I mean Colorado's a big state surrounded by other big That's states. Right. You have to drive a long way. We're surrounded by states. I guess New Hampshire's sinking. Uh, but basically, what's out there? Fox. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry. Is the hound dog behind him? No. One day they went by with a beagle behind him, and the next thing you know, the beagle came back empty, but no fox. <laughs> Sorry. He comes back in the yeah. Okay. As you were saying, I mean, in Williamstown, Massachusetts, somebody might come up to town or... If you're a little lower, they'll yeah. come over the border. I would think we might get some licenses requests on the Connecticut River border as long as New Hampshire is a no. Um, but people aren't going to drive from Massachusetts. They wouldn't need to. They wouldn't need to. I mean, other than where right, you were exactly. right, right. Well, just to put a little additional context in the Northeast, I mean, right now, on the West Coast, from the bottom of California to the tip of Alaska, and if you include Canada, cannabis is legal yeah. all the way through. California, Washington, Oregon, Canada, Alaska. Uh, right now, there are six states, um, and many of them in the Northeast, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, New York, Vermont, we're all considering, very seriously considering, um, moving to a tax We were even talking about this, seriously. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you were in that. And those guys were pushing the first medical bills were in the turn of, you know, 1998 and there. Yeah. It There's, came on in 2004. Yeah, in this last election, there were governors in, in Illinois and New Jersey, as an election previously, but uh, Rhode Island, who were, who have either governors who are now just fully supportive of gov war governors, as in the case of Rhode Island, who are reluctant and are now fully supportive of, of cannabis, um, of a system of tax taxation and regulation of cannabis. So, uh, but one thing to consider when you're thinking about your tax rate is, I know we're not doing this for money, uh, that's not the reason to do this, but uh, the extent to which you want to generate um, funds to do some of the things uh, as you mentioned, uh, Senator Lyons working on a prevention bill. Well, there may be revenue for that. Uh, the bill doesn't contemplate specific items for the revenue, but um, to the extent it goes into the general fund and, and there's money for that, you may want to have that among well, the Well, I, I think what we're struggling with is we don't want to lose money on this. Yeah. I think this is a recognition by most states that banning it has not worked that it's there, that you can't, prohibition doesn't work if people don't think they're doing a bad thing. Um, but we will need to do prevention with kids. We will have, uh, okay, we're being upstaged by the Fox. The world of sports is in perfect viewing. Oh, he is. see. Maybe it's the one that was in my backyard. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. We had a den in my backyard. He is a lady. Father's of fortunes. Okay. The lady and I just moved to raise the price. <laughs> okay. Senator, Senator, yeah. just to. You gotta, you gotta love that. You gotta love the nature. You gotta love nature. <laughs> To, there to was the, an owl out there tearing yeah, up a squirrel fox. one day, got a lot of attention. <laughs> and so, a fox. <laughs> um, well, to the point that, you're make, that you made in terms of losing money because of the impact, it's, it's um, you know, cannabis exists in Vermont now, and the RAND right. report estimates that 80,000 Vermonters probably yeah, excess we're of up that. Yeah, I think the highest of, in the nation are yeah, already users. The, the, the question really is, um, Who's going to be regulating it? Is it the people 
who are illicitly selling it that are the ones regulating, or is it regu <coughs> regulators that you all? But we have to cover designate. the cost of regulation. Cost of regulation, yeah. And we know we're going to, we know there'll be an uptake by kids. Um, well, well to, to that well, point, I know the kids can get it easier than they can get liquor. Right? Well, it's not just that in states, and, and I and I would say look at the the data from the government agencies in Colorado and Washington. They've actually seen either flat or reduction in teen use, um, but um, but statistics are a thing that are can be manipulated yes, can one be. way or the other. But um, I saw so many completely at odds, I think, when we first started looking at this yeah. data from Colorado. And right. um, it hasn't had time to gel yet, really, and figure out what's background and what's, you know, attributable. Right. The, but, one other thing I just want to mention that does get lost, I was actually at a conference um, in November in Las Vegas, um, which was uh, the largest marijuana or cannabis business conference in the world, there was 25,000 people there, and there was um, about a billion dollars of, of deals that were being done at the time. Now, I say that only to say many of those uh, businesses that were being invested in yeah. were actually not businesses that ever touched the flower or derivatives of the flower. They were ancillary businesses. I met somebody who was a mold maker in Massachusetts, and he would make confectionery molds and his, it's a 60-year-old family-run business who was there with a booth whose business is exploding now because all over the country, he's not selling cannabis. He's selling plastic molds, which are sold to companies who fill them with cannabis products and stamp on them. THC for consumer protection, they'll say in your individualized edible, say five milligrams on it, whatever you want to put on any type of manufactured product, his mold will be able to create that. So. Um, there's technology companies that are being created. There are soil companies. There's insurance products that are being created. It was incredible to see the Las Vegas, Las Vegas Convention Center filled uh, with, um, with all different types of businesses, and many of them having nothing to do with cannabis itself in terms of touching the flowers. So there's, there's um, HVAC companies. There are you know, science, scientists, there's research, there's, there's a, 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 the ancillary businesses, and I actually sat through an investor's lunch, and many of the, um, because you can't list, uh, it's complicated financial transaction, but listing on the New York Stock Exchange an illegal product is difficult. Mm -hmm. They figured out ways to do it, but it's difficult. <laughs> um, but many of the ancillary businesses are now being listed and many of the companies in, in Canada on the Canadian Stock Exchange are being listed and are being valued in the billions of dollars. So um, I don't think you should lose just, it doesn't necessarily impact what you're doing in terms of the tax rate for this bill, but the ancillary businesses associated with this industry are not insignificant mm -hmm. and they should I think that's a really good point because we, we haven't really talked about that much in here. In the background, but we haven't really well, I, is, is, are there, are there <coughs> in Vermont? I still are, think are we ought to be investing see. all the money into getting a roadside test because whoever does that is going to make a lot of money. Yeah, there's no shortage of people trying to. I'm figure sure that there out. is. A, yeah, but there are Vermont businesses, ancillary Vermont businesses that don't touch the product mm -hmm. that, are, that are popping up now. Okay. Um, so, but. As you're considering the tax rate, I would just say trying to keep it with, I mean, you can do whatever you want, but trying to keep it. I know that Washington has looked at lowering their tax rate um, just to be able to um, undercut the illicit market with greater precision. I think um, we can always raise or lower it. Um, one's easier than the other. Yes, it is. It's always easier to lower, but this is a sin, so. There's very Therefore, few industries. it's not that difficult to raise the cigarette tax. The cannabis industry is somewhat unique in that there's very few industries that are, that are asking to be taxed, you know. Well, they are happy. kind of a unique position. <laughs> I have a feeling that uh, the alcohol companies may have been fine after prohibition would be taxed. That may be the case. So. Yeah. Um, okay. Questions? David? No? Okay. Thanks.
Michelle, you're here. Is there anything, we got the bill, anything we should know that's changed or? About the administrative amendment? Yeah. Um, I heard you might have been changing the local option tax. Well, sure, I can come talk about that. Yeah. Well, what are we doing about edibles? Any tax on edibles? Or is that, are we mute on that? I think um, uh, Anthea is going to be in to talk to you about that because okay. she's generally covering all the tax stuff. Tax stuff, here. okay. Um, We're ahead of schedule okay. considering we started out with half the committee gone. Right, right. Not I was sure just popping in to say hi. So for the record, Michelle Child's Office of Legislative sure. Council, and um, I have not prepared something that was a different in context, okay. but I would say... Um, so as you know, uh, both Senate government operations and judiciary were working on the bill simultaneously. So my boss didn't have jurisdiction, but there were some provisions in there around the structure of the board that they were taking a look at, as well as um, public records exemptions, things like that. And so they did make some recommendations that judiciary unfolded into their, uh, their amendment. Um, the one provision that they did uh, change with regard to uh, your committee's jurisdiction is... Andy, you can just grab a chair and come on yeah. out. Yeah. There's sure. one there behind the coat. I, I was surprised by it too, so don't feel bad. We're ahead of schedule. <laughs> um, it's getting towards the end of the session. Be prepared for everything at all times. Getting towards the end of the <laughs> process. <laughs> <laughs> it feels <laughs> like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but we've got to see, see all those bills. They gotta go out of here yeah. if they're no. going. Well, yeah, this <laughs> one they want out this week. So, so one change that uh, that she'll be particularly interested in is that with regard to the local option, is that it was in the bill as introduced. Um, uh, it was uh, one percent, a potential one percent local option. If you look at, <coughs> I don't know if you have the same version I do. Okay. But the newest version. No, they don't have the newest version. Mm -hmm. You do not have to get it. We are okay. Moving. Well, I will just tell you in concept is they, is Senate government operations might recommend it to judiciary, and they accepted the recommendation that it be uh, up to two, that it not that they wanted to give a little more, but not require them to go to two. Um, and so there was that change. Did they make any changes in where the tax went? No. Okay. Did no. they make any changes in the ability of towns to regulate where, other than just say, yes, you can be in our town, regulate, you can be at our, in our town, but not next door to the middle school? No, I think what they did primarily is remember what they had in there, and that continues to be, is that if towns want to prohibit either cannabis establishments in total or a type of cannabis establishment, that they would have to uh, put it to a vote. Right. Um, uh, if they, but that, um, and that they could not essentially use their inherent authority under existing law that you've given to them um, through statute to essentially zone them out completely or use those types of mechanisms to ban them. And they tinkered around with that particular language. It's probably a little hard to talk to you about it without it. You think you probably yeah. want to take a look at it. But but they did not change anything. They, did they, they didn't do anything with saying you can't be within a thousand feet of a school. Because I know or, with, or things with alcohol, like that. at least in the city of Montpelier, if you're getting a liquor license, there are regulations about feet away from churches, schools. Is that a municipal decision or is that? Well, maybe under the charter. <coughs> we have a charter without, as it was pointed out to us on Friday, Thursday, when the league was here, that unless we specifically give the bulk of our towns permission, they can't do that. So do what Montpelier has Do what Montpelier and probably Burlington and places yeah. that have a charter um, that gives them authority over places of ritual or alcohol or whatever. Um, so you have to say yes or no, and you can't say yes, but not across the street from the middle school. That's not our call. That's on the house, right? 
I think yeah, I just ask you unless if that that's within ended up the authority built. that the legislature has granted them under Title 24 currently, there's nothing specifically in this bill that changes a town's ability to regulate things with regard to that that sort of thing. So they can, I think, what under the provisions they can regulate under their inherent authority. Again, no no new authority here. They can do things like parking or yeah, um, you know. For a nuisance control, things like that, but not there's nothing <coughs> specifically in here that that addresses that allows them to do that. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. let the house work that one out then. Okay, questions? Anthea, we've been told all they did was allow up to a two percent local option. We're still at ten. We're still at the. No sales tax. No, this, yeah, the 10% sales tax. No, or excise, 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 can't be sales. Go, could go to education. Um, and we, um, and, and the commission will determine the regulatory structure and then set fees that would support that structure. Well, they will recommend fees to, you right, to us system. and we will yeah. set the fees. All right. And what's the, can you remind us of the timeline? Yep. Uh, so for, for the fee structure, so the board would essentially convene this fall, so appointments kind of gelling over the summer. They would start their work this fall on rulemaking and a number of other things that, the, that they're required to report back to the General Assembly on. Uh, one of those things being kind of a rollout for year two, because remember the first year, that the, of the board's work is really going to be doing the rulemaking for the, the new commercial establishments for the registry program, for the dispensary program. And, um, and so the ED would be coming back to the legislature in January of next year with a proposal for all the different types of fees because uh, part of their rulemaking uh, requirement is there to develop um, tier structures for all the different types of licenses. So, you know, so just like with cultivators, they may decide there's going to be 10 different tiers within a cultivator's license and say, you know, for this size, we want it to be this and we think this is an appropriate fee for that. So they'll come back to you in January with, with their recommendations for that as well as for what they think they need for year two rule out because year two is when they actually start having, because the rules will have been adopted by then and you'll start having people apply for licenses, you'll start having the fee money come in, and they'll start issuing licenses um, in the fall of 2020 for cultivators first, cultivators and testing labs. Okay. And they're getting upfront money from appropriations because this sounds intensive and the kind of thing that will need some extracurricular assistance, some expertise, some... Yes, the way that it's structured now um, is that you have, for in terms of thinking about the money that's required, is you have, um, you have the five board members. Um, they are tagged at a salary of a third of a superior court judge, which would then is a, comes out around $47,000 uh, per position. And then uh, they would hire an executive director and an administrative assistant. And so there would be seven people in the board operating for that first year to do uh, a lot of work. <laughs> and, um, and there is not an appropriation in here uh, just yet. And as you know, the fees would not be coming in until the second fiscal year. And, uh, and the, the fees support the regulatory structure. So that's so basically the board will run on the cannabis regulation fund that is supported by the fees. So any um, thing in terms of what people are talking about with prevention and education or enforcement or you know law enforcement or things like that. Yeah. Um, the idea from the judiciary was that because the 10% tax money is going to the general fund, then those types of things would be dealt with through, through uh, general fund money. Um, would, did GovOps look at the salary for the board and explore that one? We talked about it a little. There, um, I think there were differing opinions about whether or not we, they could obtain uh, the level of expertise and professionalism required at 47. 
thousand. But they decided not to go to wade into that, basically. They didn't. They didn't discuss it much. No. Okay. It does concern me. That, to be honest. Where did that number come from? Well, there was a group of us working on the draft. I think okay. it's fair to say. It, but it was always uneasy for me, just because I think, you know, we got to do this right, and we yeah. got that. That is the. We and are entrusting are that yes. board to yes. really get the details right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, to me, it's not an entry level salary kind of thing. But. Well, for the area of really expertise, you might end up with a lot of retired people. Who could afford to work for that? Who could afford? Right. Exactly. Yeah. I can tell you that the, that the position, I don't, I don't know what the position is particularly called, but, but the, uh, Lindsay Wells, who runs the medical program for VCIC under DPS, mm -hmm. um, I think her salary is around 72. So that would be more like half of a judge, Superior Court judge? Right. I think Superior Court judge is around 60, uh, 160. I know you guys probably deal, you guys deal in specific numbers. I just, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm more of a rounder. <laughs> Um, but I can get those specific numbers for you if you'd like. Um, but just for context about you know about the program that's running now, um, yeah, I think that's a which is a, a much smaller program than yeah, what you're talking about control. here. So I'm sorry, I know you said in shop, I'm a little confused. So there is not right now an appropriation app. There's not. It's going to appropriate. I understand that, but I it makes me uncomfortable when there isn't an, an actual. I feel like when they get into dealing with the, the policy without strict guidelines from the people who've been making the policy, I think sometimes. You want to direct the appropriate? I would like to direct them a little bit more than leaving well, that open. Well, if the way I think about it is we, the bill ultimately lays out, okay, we want five people on the board, we want a staffer, blah, blah, blah. So, That's the outline, and then they have to do the arithmetic and figure out the, the spend. Well, it's a seven. I mean, there's not either they change the structure mm -hmm. and therefore change the number, or they. Is the forty-seven in there? The forty-seven thousand. Yes. Well, it's in there okay. in, the, in the sense that in the statutory provision creating the board, it says what the salary shall okay. be for. So okay, so it's in there. So that's in there. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. The so that does there. say so. JFO. Um, I think you know can look at that and say here we have these five numbers. It's forty-seven salary plus benefits. Um, there's not a specific salary for an ED. I, you know I don't know how you if you right. hire and I, yeah, how that sure works. That's going to be more than forty-seven, right? Um, and then an administrative assistant and how they would calculate those numbers and then come up with that. There's a directive in here for buildings and grounds to allocate space. I kind of put that as a somewhat of a placeholder, just a director, just so that people can be thinking about, well, you, you got to, I don't know if it's through, you got to come up with funding mechanisms, if there's, or if there's you got extra, you just have a few you know, extra, how, yeah. how that all works, but um, uh, I'm, I'm anticipating they will again discuss that across the hall about the costs involved in that and whether or not there needs to be an appropriation for allocation of space and gearing them up for IT or whatever yeah. resources they need to be able to go and do their, do their right. job. There's IT, here. there's, yeah. Well, it seems to me that there needs to be a linkage between the amount of the tax and the revenue that needs to be raised. And I'm seeing a little gap there uh, but between those two subjects because, you know, if you, if you look at the report uh, by the Governor's Commission, tax revenues should be allocated to fund the administrative pro and programmatic needs of the agencies that would regulate it. Plus, it should generate enough revenue adequately to cover all the costs projected to be needed for education, prevention, roadway safety, regulation, and enforcement. And I'm, I'm just a little concerned that I'm not knowing whether this is a profit center or a cost center here. Yeah, I, 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 as the Senator Brock, I've heard you say this many times, and I, 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 I wanted to see if others agree with me. I think it's very important for us to think of this as two things. 
There is the regulation, which involves you know, all the testing, all the licensing, all of the oversight of having a regulated marketplace. And as I understand, this bill very clearly says the board, you figure out the fees, you figure out who we're going to have in terms of you know, 18 producers or 800 producers and figure out the fees necessary to fund the regulation of that. And then there is the costs, what we think of as costs of whether it's law enforcement or educational materials. And, and I, I really think they are two separate things. And as I've always understood the framework, one is funded by the fees, that's the regulation. And one presumably would be funded by the revenue. And I, I don't know if it, I've heard you conflate them before. Maybe you mean to do that, or maybe it hasn't been bifurcated that way. And I just wonder if you well, I just, mind I, if I, we bifurcate I, that. I, I do mean sure. to, to combine them because this is we're voting on something that is starting a train down a set of tracks. And I would like to have a better idea of where it's going and of what the costs. Uh, because it's not that we can't calculate what these costs would be, and I think we should have a good understanding of them uh, as we start talking. This is a, a revenue committee, as we start talking about revenues in this committee. Absolutely, but the, reg the, the societal costs of cannabis are borne by society today. And so I think it's trickier. To me, that side is much trickier and much there's many more variables. The regulation side is, doesn't exist today, and we are setting it up. And, and again, that is contemplated here to be uh, a closed system within the licensing structure. And, and so, to, you know, that's the immediate need is to figure out that that structure, uh, the projecting of the tax revenue based on consumption and then what we want to spend on prevention, education, and so forth is down the road. You're right, the train's leaving, but uh, harder to pre predict and in the out years. Since well, those again, you know, we, we know we've been talking here about a 10% tax rate uh, as, a, as a projection, and I don't have a good feeling for is that even within the realm of the ballpark of right. what this is going to cover in terms of costs. And, and, and I agree with you, there may be other reasons why the state would elect to do this uh, based on what's going on now, et cetera. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't go into this with our eyes wide open as to what we're getting into. And that's, that's all sure. we're getting at. Okay. It's not that these things are incalculable. It's not that they're incalculable at least to arrange. Uh, sure. And, but do you think it's fair to think of them as two sort of columns? That, that's fine. Two, yeah. two columns that right. when added together. Yeah, have to be total. covered by the yeah. total income. But we have the ability to raise or lower the, the either column. <coughs> we don't know enough yet to set the fees. because. You don't know what the cost is going to be, and I don't think just a have. lot of decision points. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so we're commissioning the commission or the authority to go out and do that work for us, and then they will come back and tell us this is what we want to do, and this is what we think it's going to cost, and we will get to say yes, no, or maybe. The other thing is the initial tax structure, and this is probably the simplest one I've seen uh, looking at all of this. Um, but some of those might be looked at as fees, <coughs> you know, 925 per ounce of flowers. That might be a fee that gets set for the regulation of that. The other ones are pretty much sales and gross receipts, right? And the, am I missing? Well, I tell you that. Based on the grounds chart that looked at other. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm looking at. Yeah. <laughs> um, sales, we got, we got local, yeah. Excise sales, Massachusetts is at about 17%. 
with a local option on top of that. Oregon is at 17. Nevada's at 25. Washington's at 37. Plus no, and then six on top of that. Um, we're at 10. So just to go to Sir Fallon's question earlier about timing is, um, and I really probably know this, but just to remind you, you will have one legislative session mm -hmm. um, to uh, where adjust. you could adjust the tax mm -hmm. rate um, prior to there ever being um, actually any licenses even issued yet. Forget sales. You wouldn't see your first retail sales until April of 2021. But if you decided to do maybe a wholesale or tax or some, something along the lines that wasn't just the street mm -hmm. excess, if you could you have the you have next year because of the the long rollout time because of that setting up the system and going through rulemaking, um, and uh, and also I just wanted to point out just back on the fees uh, on, on page nine in section five is that's where you have the language around. Um, the board coming back to you with its recommendations on all the different types of fees. And so you have that in subsection A, and then in subsection B, which is at the bottom of page 10, at the same time, the board is uh, going to be coming to you and um, with regard to information on the resources necessary for implementation um, for the next fiscal year, um, and shall consider utilization of current expertise and resources within state government in cooperation with other state departments and agencies where there's overlap. So they're going to be coming to you with the specific build out of positions. So if you think about this is for positions and appropriations, it's looking at this first this this year, right? But then they'd be coming back to you in January and saying, well, we think, so we're going to be uh, accepting applications and we estimate we're going to be getting this number of applications. We need a position well, to process these applications. And then once cultivators are licensed, we're going to need a plant health inspector. And we're going to recommend, to you know, we're going to recommend that you shift one from ag or we're going to recommend that you create one for us. We want to utilize the services of the ag agriculture laboratory and that's going to be this much cost to them. And so they're being coming to you with a proposal in January with those costs and hopefully um, a proposal for fees that are going to support do. those costs. So is the idea is that the fees okay. are going to be tagged to supporting all those regulatory costs of what you would be approving in terms of positions. And now, how resources. are we going to tax? This does allow edibles, right? Yes. Okay. Are we taxing those at the same 10%? Excise. Excise. It's cannabis and cannabis products that the tax structure applies to. So it would be both are exempt from the 6% sales and use, and then both would be subject to the 10% excise and the up to 2% local option. Or you could do 6%, 4%, 2% local option. And then we'll go into the sales tax. And well, then we go into the Ed fund. Yes. Well, that would be for. That, would, help, that would really help property taxes. Um, we're not depending on how much revenue we bring in. Okay. I'm just thinking mm -hmm. edibles might be a well, this isn't the regulatory section though. This is just an excise tax. But remember we were hearing about the value added, you know, yes. if you think about it. So your 10% excise tax is added to the cost there, so in turn, it, it, it sort of scales in a sense, right? It's it's um, because it costs more. If you're thinking of it as I don't know what we would measure milligrams or something of THC, your tax on the edible is going to be more than the per gram of whatever, mm -hmm. right? See what I'm saying? Yeah. I yeah. didn't say that very well, but no, I, I, I got it. I, I, I got that. Okay. The labor and et cetera will also be taxed. Um, so I think the choice we face is we're going to, we could get into the weeds on this. No, I guess no. Oh, God, all right. He put my foot in it. Um, no pun was actually intended on that one. Um, I 
guess we can get into the grass either. We could get bogged down forever trying to figure out all the minute details and probably not end up any knowing a whole lot more than we know now. We can look at other states and say, well, you know, we may be undercutting the black market, but so aren't these other states. Is it Washington that's at 37? I think one of you said is thinking about lowering theirs. Okay, so 37 is too high. Other states are looking at 10, 17, something below 20. If I'm just skim reading this. Yeah, this is a we can establish yeah. as much money as we want to raise yes. from this with a percentage. And then we can have you decide how much we would raise, would recommend be raised. We can decide whether 6% of that number should go into the sales tax kitty or not. That would be our prerogative we to do can, that. Yes. And we could recommend uh, whether or not there should be uh, local options, which would be a fraction of what we've decided to raise that we would recommend. But yeah. that would probably be the order in which it would be most likely logical to do, and then appropriations can well, they're gonna decide what maybe they wanted to go someplace, different place. Mm -hmm. That would be their recommendation. We can set the tax rate. 10 <coughs> is low on a national scale. 37 is too high. But we oh, have yeah. we have some flexibility in there to adjust that rate. Remembering that when it leaves here, it'll go to the other body, and then we'd like to get this through the entire process. So, um, but that's something to think about: is look at the charts and think about is is ten the right spot to start? Mm -hmm. Because it is, even with a sin tax, easier to lower any tax than to raise it. Um, but cigarettes is about the only thing I know, or probably alcohol, you can raise without there being a whole lot of public outcry. Uh, so we could raise it. So think about that and think about where you start. Um, not to complicate things further, but there is a further complication in my mind, and that is that the original draft, th there's a cash flow problem. Uh, the fees yes. don't come in for another year until right. after the board's been up and running, uh, and then you know that sort of exacerbates until some of the revenue is really matured. Um, the draft initially had a, a way to mitigate that to some degree, which was the preferential treatment of the current dispensaries. That's been stripped, as I understand it, from the judiciary. So that that the folks across the hall are going to face a question about this cash flow thing. We, I think, got today um, S58, which is a bill that deals with hemp and CBD products. Okay. And that has fees in it that came out of the Senate Act, that's why. I'm okay. So there is a yep, it's there. potential for us to, I think there's some logic to looking at that part of cannabis in terms uh -huh. of some revenue, in terms of this cash flow thing. I don't have a good sense of the scale there, but. Um, well, maybe we will schedule that ASAP so we can get an idea. Well, I, I'll, I think that would be fine. I, I have asked folks to help me understand the, um, we, we, CBD products is, is subject to the sales tax. We already deal with that in Vermont. But in fact, we consume a very small amount of the CBD products that are Export. made here. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to figure out a way, and I've asked folks to help me at, at Anthea and Graham, that's why I chased him out earlier, um, to help me understand is there a way for us to get some kind of tax on folks who are selling Vermont CBD on the internet or selling it wholesaler to them, <coughs> shipping it out. Okay. I think that would be you know, a way to look at the, that side of it. Maybe we okay. would mirror that 
in the cannabis in, in the marijuana side, recognizing that all of marijuana can only be in Vermont, right? We're a closed system there, uh, which is not the case on hemp CBD. But anyway, just so you know, I started to poke around a little bit at that. As soon as I find my agenda, <laughs> so maybe we can. Um, so the person brings up the, how do you phase them in? Yeah. It, but that's what you decide that after you decide what you want to do when it's up and running. Then you go back and do the how you phase it in. Yeah. You don't get that one ahead of the other one. That's I agree. I think, but I think oh. there, as it happens with both bills, so there is some change that, chance yeah. to bring it but into concert or mean. more in concert or not. Yeah, gotcha. That's the half bill. Okay. We don't want to. Okay. I think we've got cannabis in. We'll take out the cannabis on Thursday and put in hemp and see if we can get a walkthrough of that bill and get an idea of what's going on. Um, so we can get some folks over here to talk about that. Okay. Okay. We're so on this break in this one. Well, well, just so. Oh. Oh. Well, are we could stay. So this is the Oh. Well, we could stay since Graham's here. Graham can do the fiscal note, and he's here on 87. So maybe right. rather than a half hour break, we'll get 15 and get Graham in. Can I just ask, okay. does anybody else? Care about this salary piece? Should we let that slide? For I think a probes is gonna. They'll deal with it. Okay. I think we can. Okay. Yeah, they. They'll deal with it. I think we can. It's, we could send a note to them saying that we would like to ensure that the salary is high enough to attract the necessary expertise. Okay, what is it now? Where? Forty-seven. <laughs> Just for classified positions? No, uh, they're exempt. Exempt positions. Everybody's exempt in their work? They're exempt for They're appointees. Okay. Sam, how long are you I do need a year. No, I um, so, 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 The rest of Vermont, and it has been suggested that you might help us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Peter Blum. I see your truck. Uh, I know some of you uh, have been in this chair many times years ago, uh, and uh, glad to be back. Uh, I, what I would propose to do today is I'll stop anytime you want, and we can do all questions if you want, or if you don't, I'll be glad to talk and okay. go through my spiel here that I prepared. Um, I, I um, worked in the Legislative Council for about 10 years in the 70s and 80s. Uh, I went over to the Public Service Board, now we named the Public Utility Commission, and worked there for 17 years, I think it was. Uh, after that, I uh, did some more telecom stuff. I was the telecom principal of the National Regulatory Research Institute for a couple of years. It's a sort of a think tank for public utilities. And uh, then I went into private practice as a consultant, and then I worked as a, not so much as a lawyer, but mostly as an expert witness in a variety of cases. Um, at the District of Columbia Public Utilities Commission, uh, some FCC cases for some uh, rural, rural wireless companies. Uh, and I did a lot of work for a small telco in Nebraska. So I had a variety of clients. Uh, the last couple of years, I've sort of let the uh, consulting coast down to almost nothing. But uh, and I'm doing other things in my life as a retired guy. I thank you all, as my taxpayers, very much for my monthly retirement checks. Uh, and uh, I felt that I, uh, when I heard that there was a lot of telecom sort of churn here, I ought to just offer to volunteer to be helpful in any way that I can. So that's why I'm here. Um, I talked to uh, several people about this. Uh, I read a lot of recent documents, but I warn you that I am 
basically seven to ten years out of date in terms of any in-depth knowledge of what's happening in Vermont. I think I'd say there hasn't been a whole lot happening in the last seven to ten years. Well, there's a lot of plans to do. There are plans, plans but yeah. Um, yeah, not BC Fiber is probably the biggest piece of progress. Yeah. <coughs> See. So. Um, I would offer that I have sort of two major topics and then a list of suggestions, minor suggestions, summary suggestions at the end. If it's agreeable to you, I'll go through it that way. The two major topics are the Universal Service Fund and broadband. And they're obviously closely related. But uh, on the Universal Service Fund, I don't know how interested you are in the history of the fund. It was enacted in 1994, and I was involved here uh, in that event. Um, it was uh, created primarily to fund the E911 program. And the E911 program still today is the greatest beneficiary of the Vermont Universal Service Fund. Everybody knows what I'm talking about here. The finance committee is two percent on your telephone bills, interstate and intrastate. Um, the um, a lot of things have changed since 1994. There are more payors. There are more competitors. The technology is different. At the time, we were very concerned about, almost exclusive concern was that we were worried that the ability to get uh, landline telephone service into everybody's home was in jeopardy from some recent events in the industry and at the federal level. And so we felt we needed the insurance of having a mechanism to replace what were called implicit subsidies built into the rates that everybody paid at the time to replace those with explicit subsidies. We didn't actually enact that part of the plan at the time. You all waited many more years before you created the first program of that kind. But the fund has been in operation since 1994, mainly funding 911, E911, um, and a, a Lifeline and a couple of other minor programs. Um, right now, I, I would say the two biggest changes since 2004 are uh, broadband and wireless. Um, both of those are fundamental changes, and they, they need to be really, I, I think they need, they require a reconceptualization of the whole concept of, of the Universal Service Fund. Um, you have been granting money to uh, facilitate broadband deployment, and it seems to be on everybody's mind that I talked with today. But it's really, it was something that wasn't really even imagined in 1994. I mean, there was, there was no World Wide Web in 1994, hard to believe, but it's true. Uh, so um, one of the things that we undertook at that time was to figure out what the base would be for the Universal Service Fund. And Vermont made the somewhat risky decision to apply it to the whole telephone bill, uh, not just to the intrastate part. For those of you who are sort of regulatory junkies, you know that in the beginning, in the early part of the 20th century, the FCC and the courts mandated that telephone companies be divided into essentially two virtual companies, one of which sold local exchange and in-state toll and had its own set of costs and its own set of revenues, and the other one sold interstate toll and it had its own set of costs and interstate revenues, and each had a separate regulator. And in the, in the worldview of a regulator, those things were so fundamentally different that they could never be mixed in any way. And um, therefore, many states that adopted universal service funds and the Congress, when it created its own federal universal service fund, looked only at its own jurisdiction as the base. We went the other way. Um, we found a Supreme Court case that sustained the Illinois sales tax statute which had been applied to both interstate and intrastate telecommunications. So the Illinois legislature crossed the jurisdictional barrier and said, there's a sales tax on telephone bills. Forget jurisdiction. Regulatory jurisdiction doesn't matter for taxes. It's on all the bill. And the Supreme Court had held it in 1989. 1994 came along and we were here, and this legislature said, Let's rely on the Supreme Court case. We'll make it on all telephone bills. I just want to tell you my opinion. That was a wise decision then, and it's been vindicated many, many times over since. Because nobody except the most dyed-in-the-wool regulator cares a bit now about what's interstate and what's intrastate. 
the regulations that once were the sort of separate worlds, the regulation has mostly fallen into disrepair, it's gone away. And uh, the methods that by which anybody who's still measuring this, the methods that they use to measure it are suspect and, and basically using rules of thumb. So I think you made the right decision in 1994. Um, I want to ask you to consider that there's a new imbalance today that the uh, Universal Service Fund, which is surcharged on telephone bills, is being used primarily to, to pay for broadband. And there's no charge on broadband. And so I think I would ask you to consider whether uh, a charge on broadband, maybe at a lower rate, I mean, you might want the same revenue or a different amount of revenue, but uh, it, it seems to me unfair, arguably, that a person who's a telephone customer has to pay for broadband employment, especially if you can't get with broadband. Um, so anyway, that's a suggestion. If you did take this uh, course that I'm recommending, I think that there would be a likely legal challenge. Um, there are many people committed to this whole regulatory jurisdiction uh, theory, and I'd be glad to provide more details, but my analysis is that the relevant federal preemption is in the Internet Tax Freedom Act, which is something that Congress has passed and that it allows for this because it's an exception. And generally, the Internet Tax Freedom Act prevents the states from taxing inter Internet access. But there is one exception for E911, it's an unqualified exemption, and there's a qualified exemption for universal state universal service funds. Um, The um, uses of the USF for broadband, uh, the uh, next topic I'd like to discuss, the uh, department has um, recommended and used a, a new connectivity mechanism, um, and they've, they've been given a small amount of money for this, and uh, they've gone through two or three rounds of grants, uh, and uh, generally it's been costing about Fifteen hundred, I guess, two thousand dollars a grant per person served. And uh, the only thing I want to say about this is that I think you might want to consider uh, restricting that so that the grants um, are for uh, better broadband. You have a goal of 100 megabits up and down in five years, and if you're really serious about that goal, you probably don't want to be granting money to companies to be building out DSL, which is not capable except under the very shortest and most ideal circumstances of providing that standard. So unless there are questions about that, I'll move on to broadband, which is my second topic. I've sort of already okay, ended, yeah. I guess. Um, I want to suggest to you that... I, I, I do have a question about that. If I Sure, I could, because I think a lot of us uh, were thinking very similarly to what you just said about are any investments, paltry though they may be, in extending broadband, it's ridiculous to have public dollars go to stretch DSL. The department was saying that um, they're a little worried about being very strict about the speeds that they would grant money to uh, support just because, you know, in a certain cases, maybe that would be better than nothing to bring someone DSL. If you're at, if you got nothing right now, you might be grateful to get this. Is it, um, and so we're, I, I, I'll say for me, I'm stuck not really understanding the, the technology map out there, but from your experience, do you have a sense of, I mean, is there anything to that argument, or should we just sort of be more disciplined and say, look, if we're getting public dollars, if you're getting public dollars, you're, you got to be not investing in old technology. I'm sorry that I can't answer it completely, because I think I don't know how serious you are about the 100-100 goal for five years. If What I'm going to say in a minute is that <coughs> that is a very, that's a stretch goal that you're not on the, I don't see you on the path to achieving that. Absolutely. And uh, so if you want to re-examine that goal and sort of 
say, well, you know, the money is for the best, <coughs> the greatest human welfare possible, or something like that, then the four megabit cell <coughs> extension might be just a ticket, because the person who doesn't have anything needs something. I mean, I, I'll tell you a personal story. I, when I retired from the state about 11 years ago, I took a job that allowed me to telecommute. And I lived up on East Hill in Middlesex. And uh, fortunately, I was 100 yards this side of the end of the cable run. And so I was able to get great broadband service from Comcast, quite adequate to telecommute. I could do video conferencing. I could do, you know, send my, I was writing papers, basically. And, send them in, get edits back, no problem, a few seconds. Um, if I had been 200 yards further up the road, I would have had to rent an office or I don't know what. I mean, it was really important to me to have that quality of broadband. That was what I had then was better than DSL. And I'm now doing you know, video streaming at home and getting 40 megabit service and quite happy with it. I always underestimate, I've, historically I've been wrong about the future need for broadband. I've always thought, well, you know, whatever is now will be fine in five years. And I've been wrong again and again and again, because it's really, the demand has really gone up. I, uh, I, I don't need to give you more examples, but um, the demand has really gone up. I, 100 up and 100 down is still a stretch goal. And uh, if, you, if you really feel that strongly that, you know, we're going to be going there, and you want to be the first, you know, state to get that, then I think you should you should limit DSL grants. But it's it's really a question of what you think best serves your constituents' needs. And I, I, like I said, I've been wrong a lot. Okay. So uh, what I want to suggest to you about broadband is that um, what that there's a thing called a network effect, and that is if you remember. Pictures, you've probably seen pictures of uh, Times Square in 1890, you know, a thousand telephone lines going on ahead and big, tall poles. And, and then 1900, 1910, 1920, the legislature started passing laws saying, you've got to interconnect these things. You know, if your company and your company are both selling telephone servers, you've got to interconnect and handle each other's calls. I shouldn't have to buy one, you know, if you're on company A and you're on company B, I shouldn't have to buy an A phone and a B phone. I should just have to buy one phone. So there was a lot of benefit from, to the whole country from that interconnection, those interconnection laws that passed. And it's, it produced network efficiencies by requiring the sharing of information and facilities in interconnection. And um, the, the internet is a different kind of thing. There's nobody selling you know, A phones and B phones. You've got, you've got to either connect to sell internet, you got to connect to the internet. But um, there's a lot of secrecy and a lot of um, sort of, I'm going to keep my information in my pocket about where my facilities are and what my prices are. And that is, I think, restricting the ability of less aware buyers to get good deals and to, to find the, the places to transport their traffic. Uh, if, you know, if you're one of the major carriers or major national carriers, you probably have very good information about what the prevailing dark fiber rate is, or about what the prevailing Ethernet rate is, or the special access rate, and all these terms in, in the industry. Uh, but if you are the director of information services for the state, you maybe, are, maybe you don't have quite that same level of information. So one of the things I'm encouraging is the state would be more active in collecting information, trying to override secrecy claims, and publish that information to create something more like an open market. The open market idea was um, really the heart of the 1996 Telecommunications Act that Congress passed. In 1996, you may know, a major act passed authorizing and mandating local exchange competition, uh, prohibiting states from restricting the entry of new competitors. But in order to make that work, when they did away with the regulation and the monopoly, they had to have some other method of keeping prices down. The way they did it was to create mechanisms for open market. 
that there had to be interconnection agreements and they had to be filed with the state commission. And some of the bigger carriers had to file standard offers so that the world could read what their prices were. Um, information about where the switches were was publicly disclosed, where the cables were in was publicly disclosed. Now I understand that that's largely sort of fallen away. And uh, I think you could get better network effects if you could find ways to restore more elements of a public market to internet protocol, especially fiber communications. Um, the, the competition model, I think, also had a strategic flaw, which was in the cities, it worked fine. They did away with regulation. The costs are low, the prices are high, new competitors want to come in and, and skim some of that cream. And so if you're in Brooklyn, it's great. You've got five or six or ten competitors you can buy from. They're all renting probably facilities from Verizon, at least originally. But they're all competing with each other in price and the, the customer gets a lot of choice. That's great when you can support multiple networks because the costs are low and the prevailing price is high. In rural areas, you know, in the Northeast Kingdom, the opposite is true. Customers are far apart, the wires and the cables are long. Um, it's very difficult to find, as you know, it's fine, difficult to find the money to even build the first network, much less expect a competitor to come in and overbuild just on the chance that he might be able to steal some customers. So, um, I think that the Congress has really underestimated the difficulties in rural areas, and I think that also argues why you, the state needs to be involved. And the state is involved, of course, as a, as a major purchaser, and there is the, the um, Telecommunications Authority that for a while built fiber and is now, I guess, renting that fiber. Um, but I, I think what I want to encourage is uh, an even uh, more aggressive planning function where rather than just talking about what is it that the state is buying and how can we get the transportation agency to better talk to the state police, they would go also into the area of where's, you know, where's VTEL's fiber and how can we best use that to support uh, Vermonters Expansion. I shouldn't pick up VTEL because they, they're they're the like the hero of the day for getting yeah, fiber. Uh, but uh, you know, where is where is X company's fiber? What price is it available at? Uh, and uh, if they could, if the state could somehow interface with the private market more in the way that I describe, I think it would also lower costs in the state, just like getting the two two agencies to talk together. You've also had a uh, problem, I guess, with uh, E911 being not fully reliable when there are uh, storms or backhoe incidents. And uh, this is, uh, I think, partly due to the fact that the state is still relying on older technologies. Um, I would suggest that you might, you cons might consider asking the E911 board to, uh, they have, right now they have two, essentially two side-by-side -side systems. They have the old system that was the telephone system uh, running on traditional telephone switches mm -hmm. and uh, they have the side by the side that they have the new next generation E911 system running using an IP protocol. And uh, it seems to me that if the E911 board would be a little bit more aggressive in moving to IP, they could find ways to eliminate some of the unreliability that they've had with these so-called remote switches. So the problem is that if there's two switches that are connected, two telephone switches that are connected, and one of them is a so-called remote switch and the cable gets cut. People on that, served by that switch can only call locally. They can't make toll calls and E911 calls don't go through. Apparently, from what I've read, some of the fire chiefs and police and whatnot have sort of done workaround protocols to sort of compensate for this 
when it when they're in standalone mode with Sokol. Uh, but why couldn't they have a failover device that switches to wireless when that happens, or uh, into an IP network if there's a fiber, you know, an IP fiber nearby? So I encourage you to ask this question to the E911 people. Um, They did come in and do a very interesting drawing of their system and switches and yeah. Rube Goldberg could have done as well. <laughs> and it, it, they assured us that they have a new contract and they're going to get more control, but after that it got yeah. vague. I don't want to criticize them. I think they've done some remarkable things. It's, Vermont was one of the first states to have an IP overlay and they've done They've also uh, done a text to E911 mm -hmm. system that, that is commendable. So they've done a lot of good things. I just think that um, 20 or 25 years into it, maybe we should be looking at whether the old part of the network of the system could be improved. And apparently from the uh, reading the newspaper clippings about isolation of remote switches, it can be improved. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So, um, how, would you, how would you go about achieving this 100-100 goal of 2024? I think I said it would be very difficult to achieve it on the kind of path. Um, I think there are a lot of problems, different types of problems, political, legal, administrative. Um, one of the political problems is that if you actually somehow came up with money to build fiber, let's say through uh, union districts, communication union districts, uh, you're going to have political opposition from the providers that already provide broadband there, whether it be the cable company or the telephone company. They're not going to want uh, to see their facilities made obsolete. You may have experienced this already. Uh, administratively, I think this is a huge task. Uh, it's much bigger than I think the DII's current job of consolidating telecommunications purchases within state government. Because what I'm suggesting is that they would look outside of state government in the interests of citizens, not just government buyers, but in the interest of expanding broadband to the public. And that they would acquire and use information about facilities not owned or rented by state uh, officers. Um, I've been talking with Senator Brock a little bit about this before, but uh, finding a, a group or a person to lead such an effort, I think, would be a real challenge. If, if you uh, were looking for someone, you need dedication to a long-term commitment, and uh, I think that the joint committee looks like it. You know, I think you're the chair, if I'm right. Um, um, it's certainly a step in the right direction. I don't think you could accomplish it by yourselves, but certainly pressure from that, from that group would be useful. Um, you'll need legal resources to do what I'm suggesting. Um, the secrecy problem has been getting worse and worse, I think, and um, I, I just I haven't seen anybody willing to stand up and say, oh, you know, you can't tell me that it's secret, that that's a fiber, uh, that pole that I'm looking at. I can see that it's fiber. You know, it isn't secret. So why is it confidential? Uh, nobody really want, nobody really has an incentive to, to sort of argue back when the companies well, make those confidential had, uh, claims. GIS people in here to tell us exactly how much they could see on their mapping for that very question. I mean, do we have to do a drive around and map every place you can see? Yeah. cable on a pole. It, it is pretty popular. It would be nice, and I don't know if it's possible legally, but it would be nice if the Department of Public Service in the process of preparing their plan, the telecommunications plan, if they could require some disclosure of the location of some of these facilities. Probably there would be a preemption claim that we would have to deal with. And um, so it would be there's some, you know, some pain involved in trying to do that, but it would be probably worthwhile. Uh, and I think doing this kind of thing um, 
requires a sort of a mixture of legal roles that may be uncomfortable. Uh, partly it's a government agency that's going to be wanting to do this planning and, and maybe buying of facilities that aren't, you know, that aren't adequate, like the telecommunications authority did. Um, partly it's going to be a private entity that's going to have to figure out how to move and buy, you know, at the right place at the right time for the best, for the best seller. Um, and uh, that, that is a hard, hard project. As a former draftsman, I'm not sure what I would recommend how you do that. Um, I'm not sure what went wrong with the my telecommunications authority or the state when it was when it shipwrecked or whatever it was. Uh, put into mothballs. Mothballs. Yeah. Uh, but I think that that's an example of the kind of thing that is a sort of a hybrid public-private entity that's operating mm -hmm. like a utility or like a like a carrier, but it has uh, some, some state obligations and public records and disclosure and transparency and that sort of thing. Um, there's also uh, a project on regarding microcells that probably is worth paying attention to. And uh, the department is apparently, you all know that the microcell project was limited. There were more cells bought than were installed, and then the company failed. And there were a lot of issues around whether the pricing was right for the things that it had to buy. Was it paying too much for power? Was it paying too much for locational information? Um, those problems perhaps could have been solved, but they went under before they could be solved. Um, so um, <clears throat> I would encourage the committee to keep talking with the department, keep paying attention, or the joint committee to with the department about how they're doing that microcell restoration project. Having those microcells out in the countryside, filling in the holes that the private industry has not provided wireless to, <clears throat> is an important first step, and it can be later built into a much more powerful. If you're, if you're on the pole, you've got electricity, you've got broadband connection, and you're picking up uh, revenues from carriers that are roaming onto your site, um, you've got a potentially workable business model, and you could later uh, upgrade the service to 4G or something like that, and uh, you know, it's, a, it's a foot in the door for providing good, good quality service to rural areas that are without wireless. So I'm happy to take questions. I have. I'm nearly done. If you, I'll be done if you want. But I have uh, no, this ten, is very some, helpful. ten summary suggestions for you if you want to hear them, or I'll take questions. No, that would be great. Okay. So. Uh, no, and I, I didn't plan on giving it to you, but I'll be happy to send it if you. If want. you s email it to Faith, she will make sure that we okay. get it. Okay. Okay. No, sure, I'll do that. So one, I would encourage. Uh, I said this already. I encourage E911 to migrate away from a service purchase and time division multiplexing model. TDM is the old telephone uh, protocol. And towards a facilities purchase on an IP model. Two, I would consider lowering the USF rate and broadening the base to apply to broadband. Three, I would look for ways to help communication union districts in raising capital and interconnecting their existing, with existing networks. And you might consider um, encouraging electric utilities to consider having a sort of department of broadband management. Um, this is something that's happening where I live now. I live in Lee, Massachusetts, and uh, some of the hill towns up in the Berkshires are very remote and haven't had broadband for a long time. And in desperation, they form co-ops, and they're taking it into their own hands, and they're building fiber rings up in the hills everybody and uh, they found a nearby electric utility Westfield Electric that's willing to come and run it for them so nobody in the town knows how to run a fiber rail. but you know the electric utility already has bucket trucks and people who know how electrons flow and that sort of thing so it makes a lot of sense for them it might make sense here too actually I've asked Pledge Council to take a look at what some other states are doing yeah, the, uh, Massachusetts has a broadband council that they might want to contact. Yeah, and somebody that used to be there has talked to me. About okay. The packages they do. Uh, I talked about strengthening the telecom planning process. Uh, 
there are a lot of things I think you can do there, um, but um, collecting more information, making it more public, and uh, trying to push for integration between the public provided networks and the private networks. Um, I'm going to skip number five. Um, you'll have to read that later. <laughs> Number six, uh, ensure that future state support for telecom facilities is conditioned on the grantee being subject to disclosures of plant location and capacity. So if you're going to, there's going to be another round of what we call BTOP funds or uh, that the state is going to administer, encourage you to, when you give money to the provider that's going to build that, make sure that you can get into it later with your, if, you know, if the agency Transportation wants to use that fiber that isn't being used, they should be able to get into it. Um, anybody should be able to get into it. Um, there's a project called FirstNet, I understand. I, I don't really know that much about, but um, it's apparently underway. A decision's been made to mm -hmm. pick one particular vendor that a lot of people aren't happy with. And uh, I would suggest you look into better ways to. Um, integrate this new money with the communication needs of the state, possibly by joint utilization of towers uh, or by requiring some conditions on um, carrying other people's traffic. Um, but that may be impossible. I don't know enough. Starting starting the discussion. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, I encourage you to investigate whether microcells currently owned by the state can be installed and serve as a nuclei for a future hire quality wireless service. Um, <clears throat> number nine, I encourage you to investigate um, power backup requirements. Um, the modern network is very electricity dependent. In the old days, the phone worked even during a snowstorm because the voltage came from the central office. And if the power was out, you could call the power company and say, hey, my power's out. Can't do that anymore. It's all that's all electric current from the from the grid or its batteries, and batteries are really important if, uh, if you, especially if you haven't thought about it until the power goes out. And uh, so there should be a lot of discussion about what the expectation is for battery life. Should people have two-hour batteries? Should they have 24-hour batteries? Should they have a choice? <clears throat> if my if I have DSL and my uh, service depends upon a remote platform down on the corner. You know, those little cabinets that don't have anybody in them, but they're the size of a refrigerator and they have electronics in them. They may not, they may have two hour batteries or they may have 24 hour batteries. If they have, whenever those batteries go out, my service dies no matter what I have. Uh, and I encourage you to investigate dark fiber legal status. Um, if there's a lot of overbuilt fiber, it makes a lot of sense economically if you're going to put a fiber run in to overbuild it, to put in multiple strands for future use. And moreover, even for a lot of the fiber that was installed years ago, there's an electronic equipment now on your end that greatly multiplies the amount of data that can be pushed through it. So there's a lot of overbuilt fiber in the state, and um, Alco has some of it. I don't know personally what Alco's utilization rate is on their capacity, you know, the utilization of the capacity. Uh, and I understand that they're beginning to open it up to some distribution utilities, but um, there's a lot of fiber out there, and finding out whether you can require access to it is an important question. And that's the end of my presentation. I'll be glad to take questions. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the chance to come up and talk to you again. Oh, this, this kind of took the last three, four weeks and helped it seem like a coherent whole because we've just yeah, been true. shooting at it. Um, committee, Randy. There's been a lot of talk about using existing power companies, telephone poles, to transmit fiber to the premises. Do you have an opinion one way or the other as to whether that's a strategy that makes sense? Well, uh, let me try to split the question. Um, if fiber to the premises makes sense, and I think that is the best way to achieve your 100-100 goal, 
uh, right now. I think everything else is kind of a little chancy. I mean, they talk about it. Maybe the cable companies can do it in some places. Maybe the wireless people can do it someday. Maybe the, tele the satellite people can do it someday. Um, right now, I think fiber is a safe bet. But it's expensive. It's no more expensive than running co copper, but nobody's running copper anymore either. Um, and no? You, OK. And nobody I know is running copper. Uh, it's, it's copper has been run recently to it? replace all <coughs> Anyway, fiber is expensive, especially if you know people live a quarter mile from each other. And but if you decide you want that, then New England is unusual in that we uh, uncharacteristically carry a lot of stuff on poles. The rest of the country, a lot of it's buried. Uh, plowed in the, in the Midwest, they plow it in the ground because they don't have any rocks and it's much more durable. Here it's up on poles and the trees fall on it and the wind blows it down. Um, but we have, we have a protocol that is not optimal and the department's plan recognizes this. Uh, there's a protocol for sharing poles and there's a pricing system and there's a way to go about asking for pole space. You, you ask the pole owner to prepare and you move stuff up and down so that they make space for you on the pole. And there's a formula for how much you have to pay. And there's some adjustments needed to it. But I, given the number of rocks that used to be in my land, I don't see us plowing it in. And if you're going to have fiber, it's mostly going to be on the poles. Is that, is that that's all the whole of your question? Yeah. Is it practical from a cost and oh. solution standpoint? Well, uh, I wish I could give you, you know, an average cost of installation per mile. You need to talk to somebody else. But my anything I once knew about this is old. Uh, but it's, you know, you the department has paid, I think, fifteen, seventeen hundred dollars per customer under the uh, new, new grant program to extend service. Some of which I assume is fiber. Some of which is DSL. So. You know, Think about on the order of a thousand or two thousand dollars a customer of capital expense, and um, I can't tell you if that's practicable. You have to decide that. <laughs> um, it's tricky for us trying to learn all this stuff. We work for four and a half months a year. Uh, we're very dependent on our department, which. If I'm remembering correctly, has three or four people that sort of work on this. If that, happened, yeah. if that. Yeah. Um, and so the telecom plan that the legislature mandated going back a few decades be updated every 10 years has been vexing to this group of people here um, for not being as robust as we might think is necessary. But it is tough that we, you know, I'm assuming we haven't funded an independent contract to do it. Uh, we kind of lean on the department and just say, you're supposed to do this. Setting aside the timeline, which is badly overdue, do you have, do you share my assessment that it's really tough for us to do this kind of planning without a robust telecom plan document and, and do you have some suggestion for us of how we might get one if you agree that what we've been presented isn't terribly adequate? Um, I think the department's draft telecom plan has some things in it that are good innovations that I've never seen before. Um, they have better quality broadband maps than the FCC has. Because the FCC averages everything to a census block level and then says, oh, if you have, if you're in my census block and you have broadband, I must have broadband. That's the way things look in Washington, D.C. So the department did a lot better than that. They, and they also, the first time I saw, um, produced a wireless uh, availability in that. I don't know if Corey, Corey's in the room, but I understand that Corey Chase went around with it box full of cell phones and measured it. And I, I commend that. I think that's detailed, good GIS quality information that helps you make decisions about where, you know, for example, the microcells might 
logically go. Um, I also think that they took a comprehensive and competent review of all the different industries and what the challenges are in it. Um, I th my, my personal impression was it was a little bit more cautious than I would have liked. But I do think it was a competent plan. And I, I mean, I could answer more detailed questions about where you're looking for more detail. Uh, it, it might be worth your time to review the statute and see whether they did everything you told them to do last time and, and then add things that you think they should do next time. Well, let's perhaps put it in a, a slightly different way, that if you had to produce uh, the state's telecommunications plan, uh, who would you hire if you were looking at an outside party to produce the best plan that we could? That perhaps it is a level higher than what we got from the Public Service Department. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm really prepared to answer that right now. Um, there are certainly consultants who could be acquired to help. I don't, I don't think you want to ask a, cons a contractor to write the plan, do you? What about assess the plan? Yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I, I'm surprised it, I mean, it feels as though it's a competent plan with some good parts to it. Yeah. Maybe I'm not the guy you want to assess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I they did what the law asked them to do. I think maybe, as you said, we want wanted or want more yeah. and we need to can you look at the law. Can you just give me an idea of what parts you felt like you were sort of hungering for? When I think personally I didn't and I will admit I didn't get through the whole thing because I kept writing notes. I didn't find anything concrete. To me a plan I thought it was a good review. Yeah. I thought it said what we'd done. But going forward, I just had a hard time finding a concrete recommendation for yeah. I, I, I think my, my impression was that when they found a problem, they said, you could look at this. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what they did. And I, I, <laughs> if I were you, I would interpret that as, you better look at that. <laughs> yeah. I think they were being, I think they were, that's why I said cautious. Yes, I, they, were they, were, they were obviously interagency issues that they were trying to finesse and, and uh, they didn't, they didn't want to be too directive to the legislature. I think they saw it as a safer course to just say, here's an opportunity. I think the other thing is we all know that it will take some money to do anything. and when you've come up with a no tax, no fee mandate, at least until this year, it's pretty hard if you don't have any money. I can't have a plan to, that to, calls to, for a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, to do something that says, you know, to really do this right and in a reasonable time frame, this is the kind of investment we're going to need. Um, and I think we saw it as a summary and not yeah. so much a roadmap. So I saw you nodding that the chair sort of preempted my question. Are you convinced that to get the kind of coverage we want, it's going to need some taxpayer dollars or ratepayer dollars? Yes. And do you have any idea of what a logical funding source for that might be? Funding would be safe enough. I like the Vermont Universal Service Fund model as a surcharge on the services that it's that are provided through the network. Um, the, um, as I said earlier, I think asking broadband to pay its share for building broadband is a fair thing. I don't have to run for election, though, so it's easy for me to say. Uh, we tried the satellite tax. That didn't go very well. <laughs> That's right. Just because they put runners on the bottom of your direct TV all day and all night. 
And on the question of how do you spend the money, how do you, I mean, what you want to do is you want to make sure that the spending, spending on broadband gets you something that you want and that you wouldn't otherwise get. And um, it's hard to do that. Uh, the FCC has enacted a mechanism of auctions where they'll take areas that are underserved and they'll ask companies to tell us how much you need in order to serve this area. And then they rank them all nationally and they say, well, we have this much money and so we're going to start at the cheapest per line and we're going to go down to a run out of money and then that's the end of the program. That's one way to do it. Um, you don't want to overpay and when you do pay, you want to make sure that the stuff that gets built is properly available for other network users, not just the retail customers of the company that got the grant. Um, I don't know if I can say any more detail right now. Have you seen the administration's plan on beta loans? I have not. Is it, is it a plan to help communication union districts? Yes. Yeah. To help them get them started, yeah. bonded. I, I really like the model of, I, I draw the analogy to roads. You, know, you, you wouldn't want UPS owning your town's roads. And so the idea that there's some public ownership of the cable makes sense to me. I don't think the towns should be, or the union districts, unless they're very expert, should be necessarily running the services, but they should be offering the roadways and cables to the to somebody that they can trust to run it properly. And then if they don't like them, they can change that. But at least the facilities are there. So the idea that there would be some financial help to the communication unions districts, I like that. If you were to look at another state, uh, based on, on your experience, that does telecommunications planning well, is there any place that you would point us to to look at as a model? I'm going to consult my former business partner before I answer that, but I will, I will write to the committee. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. What should we have asked you that we failed to? <laughs> I think we've had a great conversation. Let me run on and on. I think I covered everything that I wanted to say, so thank you for your patience. And it's great to be back and see some of my old friends and some new ones. That was so, thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Yes. yes. How's the cell service in Lee, Massachusetts? It's good in my house. Two bars. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm only two blocks from the central office. If I wanted to get DSL, I could probably get I DSL. I have never experienced worse driving. Than, huh? You know, I, I know it feels bad here, but I do want to tell you a horror story. I did some work out in Wyoming. Those guys, you know, they had ranches out there, and there are hundreds and hundreds of acres. And uh, those people had U.S. West. And U.S. West was sort of infamous as being the company that invested the least in the network. And um, they, were, they were telling tales about how the equipment in the central office switches, the so-called line cart where the wires first come in, were sold that they aren't manufactured anymore, and they were buying them off eBay. To, when, it, when yours broke, they would buy one off eBay, put it in, hope it worked, and even maybe restock the one that didn't work so the next guy that, you know, when you call, you get my old line card. And I heard stories about these ranchers who, you know, their service was down more than it was up, and they would have to drive in their pickups up to the ridge they were to make their phone calls daily, you know, it'd be like half an hour on the ridge to make all my phone calls. So we got it bad, but nothing like Wyoming. Okay. Okay, thanks very much.